Welcome to another episode of Our City. I'm your host, Martina Scalenzi. We have an exciting episode lined up for you today. We'll be speaking with Mark Furukawa from Dr. Disc. He's a fixture on Twitter and a fixture in the local Hamilton music scene. He'll be explaining the revival of vinyl, why he's doing what he does, and telling us a little bit about Dr. Disc as a business. We'll also be speaking with Maria from Hargatai's, a new crepery that's opened up recently in Barton Village. She'll be telling us about crepes, where she comes from, and what it's like running a business on Barton. So thanks for joining us. Stick around. This is Our City. City. I'm your host, Martinez Galenzi. We're sitting here with Mark Furukawa of Dr. Disc. So Mark, welcome to the program. Nice to finally meet you. Absolutely. We've yeah, had we've... Uh, encounters on social media, various kinds, and it's, it's great to make the introduction in person. Many times. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. So you run what is probably the most well-recognized, I'll say, record store, uh, certainly on Twitter, Thank you. in Hamilton. And that's pretty cool because music stores are kind of a dying breed right now, aren't they? They're sort of like a, a dinosaur that doesn't know when to quit. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a really hard struggle, but we've been open since 91 in the downtown core. And actually things are on the upswing again uh, due to, believe it or not, vinyl. So Interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's back up then sure. and see how you got involved with this because the store has been here since 1991. Right. So what's your uh, connection with the store? Well, my, my parents weren't really into music, but when I was in high school, I started doing high school dances with a couple of friends. And then that launched into university, and I started working in a couple of clubs. And I thought, with the, the, the light bulb went on, and I, I like, I need the, the, the hottest new tunes, the quickest and the cheapest. So I, I should work in a record store. So I was at the University of Western Ontario in London, and that's where Doctor Disc started. It was um, a small, just it used to be in this old, tiny little shoe store, the space. And the year I got to university, they just expanded into a larger location, a family-run business. And so I got a job there because they were the only ones that had, you know, catering to 12-inch singles and um, not only dance stuff, but like all the great stuff in the mid-80s that was happening um, from the UK, a lot of European stuff. Mm -hmm. So I started working there. And then um, after seven years, I got my three-year BA. I was kind of an underachiever. <laughs> and uh, I got an opportunity to open the location here. So I, I, I just finished my degree, and they were in the process of expansion in, in the early 90s. And so in 91, they said, we're, we're going into Hamilton. Do you want to manage it? And I said, sure. So um, a couple weeks later, after I said, I'll move there, they said, well, how about you be a partner? And I didn't have any money, so I went to the bank of mom and dad. And they had just gotten their redress money for being interned in World War II out, okay. out west. So they had $40,000 sitting in the bank. And they're like, well, it's your, it's your inheritance. If you want it now, you can have it. So away we went. So, you know, I, I couldn't really fail knowing that uh, the seed money had come from internment camp redress money. Yeah. So it was a yeah. lot of impetus to keep it going and make a success out of it. So no kidding. there have been some really lean years, and but I'm glad we stuck with it. and. Recently, I've really rediscovered Hamilton and my roots, and yeah, you know. Well, and, and I wanted to I wanted to ask a little bit about that because you're but the lean years and the, mm -hmm. the resurgence is that partially due to social media? Because Doctor Disc has almost twenty five hundred followers right, on Twitter. Right, right. Do you find that that, that plays a lot of role in, in the uh, resurgence of your business? You, you know what I when when things are good, you kind of take things for granted, and um, being in Hamilton, uh, even since ninety one. Uh, my birthplace is Barrie, well not my birthplace, but my family home is in Barrie and I considered that always my home. And it was kind of this epiphany, my parents passed away, um, in, my mom in 2006 and my dad in 2010. And it was after that I, I said, well I'm a Hamiltonian now. I, 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 I was kind of, I came out of my shell in a sense after dealing with all that trauma and grief mm -hmm. and um, rediscovered the city. And so along with that we sort of divvied up social media duties at the store. and. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't, I've got enough stuff on my plate, I didn't want anything else, but Twitter was the last thing on the agenda and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So, so it's sort of re reluctantly, but I just plunged in and I've met so many people, um, reconnected with the music scene like intimately. Um, and not only people in the music scene, but the, the, the social media uh, sphere, I guess you'd call it, or, or, or you know, 
population in Hamilton and the usage is just off the charts. Yeah. And people of all walks of life, it's very easy to connect. So I reconnected with the city in that way and the store was, as a result sort of came along for the ride. It was, the Twitter I find is, um, that's my thing and it's sort of like you imbue your personality into the store to make it interesting. So, I mean, if you're just tweeting as a business, it gets boring after a while. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I go out to a show, I take pictures and people like to see what Mark from Dr. Disc is up to. And um, it, it helps the store as well. It creates this dialogue, this engagement, makes me more approachable. People come up to me, you know, I, got a, I, I was at the Casbah a while ago, one of my favorite live venues, and um, uh, Brody at the Casbah is big on Twitter and we always sort of compare notes. And he's standing at the bar and, and he's like, hey, taps me on the shoulder and he shows me this tweet and it's from uh, this guy named Tyler who I know really well now and I think his Twitter handles the Ninja Squad but he said I think I'm standing beside Mark at Dr. Disc at the Casbah. <laughs> so I tweeted back you know I just tweeted back um, yeah and he's gonna buy you a beer as well right so when he checked his phone we just looked at each other and started laughing so I mean it's those kind of things that along with um, rediscovering the city in all ways and, and being supportive of not only the community but especially the arts and culture and music yeah. which keeps you know people interested and aware and um, you know they have an investment because a lot of the music comes from Hamilton so they like to support you know the home team as it were yeah. um, that's sort of what's brought it I guess not the resurrection, we've never really been dead, but the sort of revitalization again and rebirth of, of the store. It's kind of going through this, almost a new generation of, of patrons and also awareness, cultural awareness. So it's a really exciting time. And do you think that's, obviously through social media, those connections yeah. have been made. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's also running somewhat parallel to the revitalization and renewal of the area? I think so too. I mean, I've met a lot of the younger generation, um, you, you know, who, weren't even really aware when vinyl was in existence, say, before. And they don't have the same stigma that when I came to Hamilton, all, a lot of the people were kind of naysayers. And we were in the shadow of Toronto and, and, you know, we looked towards Toronto as an example to do things. But now it's, uh, what I find is, especially you look at just James Street North, everybody mentions that, but it's such a microcosm of entrepreneurial spirit and, and new ideas and people taking chances yeah. and that I think is the new Hamilton you know people say steel was our industry and when steel faltered I, I think people there wasn't any kind of industry in a sense as far as manufacturing or a product to fall back on so what I think people did was they looked around and said we can do this on our own we don't need to have a DeFasco or a Stelco I mean I, I, I don't in any way uh, you know I'm not happy that they're gone. I mean, anything that sort of is a great employer like that, that fails, um, you know, it creates a real sure. hardship for a lot of people in the city. Yeah. But I think people, as a result, people learned, because Hamiltonians are very resilient. You know, that's one of the top three terms I'd oh, say I with Hamiltonians, yeah. um, that they started relying more on themselves. And with younger people saying, you know, we, we don't have to follow what Toronto does. We're just going to do, do things. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole art crawls just started out of just people just doing things. It wasn't a government initiative. There wasn't any money in it. It was just, you know, Dave from Mixed Media and a couple other people just getting together and saying, you know, we're going to get people downtown and it's a free thing. And we're just going to walk around and keep yeah. our shops open. And you're, you're, I mean, your store, for people who, who are watching who might not know, you're right there. Mm -hmm. you're, Actually, we're just right, right off. North. We're about a block off the drag and people yeah. kind of have their blinders on. They tend to walk up and down James Street. So in the summer, we have this concert series on our, we've got a lower roof out back which overlooks two parking lots. So we have this Raise the Roof concert series every art crawl. We're doing it from May through October this year, every every month once, you know, on the Friday night that the art crawl's on. And we just have um, every band on the hour from six to 10, one band on the hour. And um, they play, play like live music. The stipulation is you have to be from Hamilton or surrounding area. Yeah. And so we're promoting not only, you know, the art crawl itself, um, you know, fighting the stigma that nothing happens downtown. So we're creating some, you know, we're being ish disturbers. Putting a concert on a roof. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's free. And yeah. people yeah. who wouldn't necessarily go to a venue to see this kind of music and wouldn't be exposed to it otherwise, because there's so many demographic, different demographics of people walking by. It's like, hey, you know, they hear something, they're attracted, they come over, so they get to know where the store is. They hear Hamilton music, 
and they're like, they're interested, you know, yeah. like, this is really good, where can I buy this, or when are they playing live next, I want to see it. So not only is it, it's a trickle-down effect as well, not only is it us giving back to the community, but the community in turn, you know, either buys the disc, or hopefully goes to see them at the Casbah, or the St. Hollywood, or, you know, follows them on the internet, or gets on yeah. Twitter as a result, and wants to know what we're doing, and when the next show is, and who's playing. So it's this kind of effect that's really prevalent right now amongst a lot of people and everybody's got this fever again. I, you know, I, I think it's like a tidal wave and, it, and it's, it may not be peaking quite yet, but it's, it's, there's some momentum there. Well, that's cool know? if we have more to look forward to. Oh, I think so. I, I think ask so. You about vinyl because mm -hmm. that's one of your biggest attractions, I guess. I mean, it's kind of a unique thing to be selling in 2013. I had a discussion. I was at this hip hop, um, not convention, it's like a networking thing that was put on at the Casbah last night. And these guys from Jacasa Studios were next to me. Everybody had little tables and they're representing. And this guy started asking me about a turntable. And I basically said to him, if someone ten, said to me 10 years ago, your bread and butter is going to be vinyl in 10 years. And otherwise you'll be out of business. And that's going to be your strongest seller. And people are going to, there's going to be this huge resurgence. And young kids are going to be buying turntables and buying records. And I, you know, I, I would have told them they were nuts. Yeah. I would have given them a key to the nearest sanatorium to go relax for a while because it's like, Nobody, myself included, I've been in the music business, you know, 30 years now, and um, nobody predicted it, the yeah. resurgence of vinyl. Yeah. And I've thought a lot about it. I'm not going to digress too much, but it's the tactile nature of having something and collecting it and holding it and the memories attached with this record. You know, there's one aspect where it's an audiophile person who says, oh, I think vinyl sounds warmer or better. You know, to me, it's a human aspect where people... You know, it went from a record where you clean it, you turn it over, you look at the, the album jacket. Yeah. It went to a CD, which is a smaller format. You still touch it, it goes in the player. But other than that, you listen, you know, you do your work or whatever, and you listen to it. It's almost becoming background music. And then it's become, it comes to, you know, downloading, where you don't touch anything. Yeah. So you, you, you click a couple, you know, keystrokes on your keyboard, music appears in your, in your headphones. And there's just, there's no real, and I hate to say it, but there's no value to that. Right. Like when, if you downloaded an album last year, you don't remember the significance of that. Right. But I remember um, getting a, buying a certain record, finding it in a store and taking that record home and opening it. And when I listened to that record, it was exciting. So yeah. there's a reference point, there's a nostalgia attached to it. Yeah. So I think that's why people have swung back Towards records because a lot of the cool indie bands never gave up vinyl so they they always put it out and they did these limited edition things so it was kind of hit because if you listen to alternative music which we cater to a great deal in the store um, people really gravitated towards yeah. collecting about the band I gotta cut you off but thank you so sure. much for coming it's been great great to meet you Absolutely. I really appreciate it Thanks so much. thank you my my going policy is if I have it you can have it so if there's something that you have special requests, then I will definitely cater to anything you want. The set for our city provided by Hansa Lubers, located at 144 James Street North in downtown Hamilton. City. I'm your host, Martinez Galenzi, and I'm sitting here with Maria Brannigan of Hargitize. Now, Hargitize is a creperie, it's a restaurant, but it's just called Hargitize. That's the so one. Hi. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and tell us about your business. So let's start with you. So who are you and where are you from? Uh, um, I was born and raised in Budapest, Hungary. I lived in Germany for five years. and. When I was 15, we came to Canada, and we settled in uh, beautiful Hamilton, Ontario. So I've been here since 1993. No kidding. And why, why did you come to Hamilton? Um, to be honest with you, I had, we didn't know anybody anywhere else in Canada, but my dad just happened to have an old childhood friend that happened to be living in Hamilton at the time. So we ended up here. So here you are. Yeah. And you stayed in Hamilton then, and you, you just recently opened your restaurant. Yes, I did. So yes, I did. when did you open? Officially, the doors opened Friday the 13th, April. 
uh, of last year. It well, was an art crawl. <laughs> intentionally, oh, I see. So there you chose for that. I was going to say, maybe it was a luck thing, but. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah, and, and your, your primary menu item is, or are crepes. That's right. Officially, I am a crepery and ice cream. Um, I do serve sweet crepes as well as savory crepes. And, uh, you know, I'm always looking to possibly expand the menu, hopefully soon. Sure. So why crepes then? Um, we went, we went on a, a couple of years ago on a family day uh, weekend, we went uh, ice skating with a bunch of people in Toronto and it was really late at night and they said, oh guys, we're starving, let's go someplace. And they dragged us to a creperie somewhere in Toronto and it was after midnight, the lineup was out the door. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, full house. Now granted, I understand that's Toronto, you know, this might not be exactly the same thing for Hamilton, but, sure. uh, but I said, you know, what's the big deal? They're just crepes. I grew up eating crepes because I'm Hungarian and it's traditionally not just French, but it's a very European dish. Sure, yeah. So I eat it all the time and I was like, what's the big deal? You know, it's nothing. But I was like, well, Hamilton doesn't have a crepery. There's an idea. Maybe I should start my own crepery. And it was like, it was like a brain fart essentially <laughs> when I told my family and they said, oh, what a great idea. And yeah. Yeah, three years later, I, uh, I opened the place. Fantastic. And how have you found it? What's it like owning a crepery? Well, you know, I mean, with any new business, I have my challenges. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's interesting. You meet a lot of different people, especially because of where I am. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of professional people. There's a lot of people that are just, you know, living in the neighborhood and, you know, perhaps work, el work elsewhere. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been tough, especially the fact that it's, uh, it's the first year business, it's winter, uh, the area has its challenges. Some people don't know what a crepe is. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's these hurdles that I have to get past, but yeah. uh, you know, in well, time. Let's, let's talk about the area that you're in because uh, you've actually set up on Barton Street, right in Barton Village, in That's fact. That's correct, yeah. So why did you choose Barton Village? Well, I won't lie, uh, affordability was definitely one of the key points, um, but m probably most importantly, um, my husband is actually from the North End. He grew up, born and raised there, and um, I've lived there myself for, for several years. And uh, looking at the area, I felt like, you know, it needs something. There's nothing going on. There's, you know, there's the occasional pizza joint, you know, you have Tim Hortons and, you know, now you have A&W and slowly but surely things are progressing. But I just, I felt like, you know, if, I, if any area needs something happy and joyful, well, Barton Village is it. And, you know, nothing gets more joyful than ice cream, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> ice cream and crepes. Ice Barton cream and crepes, Village. yeah. Perfect. And then you do, you would get a very mixed crowd there because, the, of course, the hospital is, is quite close. Do you find you have a lot of folks coming over from the hospital then? It's, it's a bit of an uphill battle there too. I mean, you know, granted there's tons and tons of people working in the hospital and yes, they are busy working, saving lives. So I can only imagine how hectic their, their schedules must be. Yeah. So a lot of times I find they, they tell me, oh, I have to skip lunch or I can't make it out or, but you know, once in a while and slowly but surely I'm getting an increase in, in, in hospital clientele. Yeah. And you must be also then getting clientele from around the city a little bit more too, because I would think crepes are kind of a destination item. Ideally, yes. And especially the fact that, you know, we're, we're, these places are few and far between where you can get crepes. Yeah. Um, again, you know, social media, going back to social media, it's all about, for me, it's all about Twitter yeah. because it does draw the people in. And even though, if, especially if they're not in the area and I'm, I'm not able to properly advertise and get big, you know, 30 second spots during the Super Bowl, <laughs> You know, it, it, it helps immensely and, and it yeah. grows and it, it, has, it has, you know, a life of its own. So, you know, now I'm starting to get people coming in because they've met me through Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's starting to, you know, it's starting to pick up momentum. That's good. That's yeah. good. And uh, tell, me about, tell me about Barton Village because Barton has a, a bit of a reputation in Hamilton as being kind of a rougher area to do business and to live. And, and but yet you set up your shop there and, and there is the Barton Village BIA. So tell us, tell us about the street. Well, it's, it, well, you know, it has its challenges. Of course it does. Being one of the longest streets in Hamilton, you know, it has these pockets of, of, of population and, and different businesses and it kind of goes in waves. It has its hot zones and it has some not so good uh, parts. And 
I happen to find that where I happen to be, that area is really starting to uh, to get better and improve. And you know, you're starting to see people actually caring more about how their how their place looks. Now I know it's a, it's a it's it's a long way from being the the, the best area in town, but um, you know, it's one step at a time. Yeah. Well, on your on your website too, I noticed you talk about how. Lock Street and James North and a number of these other areas have kind of undergone their renaissance and at some point then that may happen to Barton Village. Absolutely, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of that because it has no place to go but up. Hmm. Um, especially with the Pan Am Games coming, you know, there's, there's, there's a desperate need for Barton Street to, to improve and get better. Yeah. So since, since we happen to be in the, you know, down down part of, of, uh, of the area, well, hopefully we're gonna go up and uh, yeah. get better. And the, the area does need more business and it needs more reputable businesses and startups and, and young people and new ideas, not just the same old and same old. Because I do find there are many businesses along Barton Street, but they happen to be, a lot of them happen to be a previous generation mm. and they don't do internet and they don't do websites, they don't do Facebook, no Twitter. So they have no web presence, and I find I find as a business that's a that's a detrimental um, it's very attitude to, to have. To yeah, promote then. yeah, it is, yeah. and you know it's it's like a train. You you better get on that train because when it leaves the station, you know you'll be left behind. Yeah, so. and you but you're also taking an active role in that area because you just mentioned to me that you've joined the BIA. Yes, I did recently. Recently, I just got uh, elected to be uh, on the board, so I'm very excited and I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, hopefully try and uh, get involved on a, on a much deeper level than I am now as just, as just a business owner. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we're working on some exciting things and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll all pan out for us. So what, what can we look forward to then in Barton Village over the course of the next while, while you're on the board? Well, we are, um, one of the big things that we're trying for right now is, is um, to, bring, to bring a farmer's market into the village actually. Um, you know, we're scouting locations, we're, we're exploring opportunities and talking to people and getting their feedback as to, what do you guys think? Is this something that you would support? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, 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 I guess, my pet, my pet project yeah. <laughs> for the next little while, for sure. Exciting. Let's go back to crepes because on your site as well, you mentioned how they, they and you mentioned earlier too, that they're typically understood to be a French food, but being Hungarian, you ate them growing up as well. Absolutely, it, it is. It, I do believe it uh, originates somewhere from Brittany, but um, it's a European. It's a European dish found in almost every country in Europe: Spain, yeah. Portugal, Poland, like you name it. And Hungary just happens to be one of them that uh, that supports supports the dish. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we all put our own spin on it. We all, yeah. every culture will do something different to make it their own. So what, what would the spin be then from a Hungarian? From a Hungarian perspective, perspective uh, probably the most, two most common ones is um, the, it's a crepe, a, 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 two of them, one being a savory crepe, uh, it's a chicken paprikash crepe, um, where the stew is put into the, inside the crepe and uh, topped with cheese and oh, wow. sour cream. It's very delicious. So that's like the meal. savory, oh, it's a full meal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a 16 inch crepe. So wow. it's, uh, it's almost about a pound and a half of food by the time you get it. So yeah, it's definitely filling. And on the, on the sweet side, we have one that's called the Gundel. It's named after an original hotel and restaurant uh, entrepreneur out of uh, Hungary, I believe from the 30s or 40s, um, that invented the dish. And it was a winner at one of the international food fairs back in the day. And that's, um, it's uh, ground walnuts with raisins topped with chocolate fudge and traditionally it is is, is flambéed at the table but I don't do that. Wow. <laughs> the fire wow. department would not be impressed. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. that's, that's incredible. So how, how many different types of crepes do you serve? Do you have a fixed menu? Um, I do have a fixed menu but because I'm not a franchise uh, my my going policy is if I have it you can have it. So if there's something that you have special requests then I will definitely cater to anything you want. Um, assuming I have it. Just the other day, somebody on Twitter sent me a message saying, do you have pickle crepes? And I was like, what is that? 
She's like, I'm crazy about pickles. I'm like, well, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick you up some pickles if that's what you want. So you make so. a pickle crepe. Yeah, if, if, yeah, if somebody wants it. <laughs> if somebody's going to eat it free willingly, you all, all the power to you for yeah, sure. Yeah, interesting. But it's definitely not the norm, I have to say. That's a very unique request. Yeah, what is, what is the norm? What's the most common that you sell? For, for sweet crepes, I'm, uh, I'm a big believer in fresh. Well, I mean, I, I clearly, I make everything fresh from scratch. A lot of fruit. And, uh, you know, Nutella tends to be a, a really big, uh, big thing on crepes. Most people, they either love it or they hate it. Yeah. But the people that do love it, it's like, it's like catnip for them. Yeah, yeah. So that's very popular. Yeah, crepes seem to have their own following and their own culture that kind of goes with them. Uh, they, they do. Uh, they do. Like I had mentioned earlier that some people don't know what a crepe is. Now, the people that do, they'll, I've, I've heard them say they'll go anywhere to get a good crepe. And yeah. uh, I've, I've had some really incredible compliments from customers where, oh, the last good crepe I had was in France and this is incredible. So, so, so I think I'm they, on the right track. And hopefully they try them at your store. Yeah, Maria, absolutely. Maria, thank you so much for coming on the program. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us on Our City. We look forward to bringing you a brand new episode on March 25. Until then, I'm your host, Martinez.